the rest of Aquarimax here, everyone. Um, I am glad to see you all. Thanks for joining in. I'm trying to look back at the earlier chats. I don't know if it's going to let me in there. Let's see. I can see that Ants Pakistan, Ashley N, Frank the Tank, 503 Menagerie, who just got some new Punta Canas that are insanely bright orange. Really happy with them. That's awesome. I hear that the Tangerine line was uh, actually isolated from that, I think, or was it Santa Lucia? I'm not sure. But uh, Frank de Tanks Punta Cana producing lots of reds and oranges as well. That's great. I uh, am fascinated by Punta Cana. It's one of my favorite armadillidium vulgaria morphs for sure. As you can see here, this is not, this is not the uh, microvarium. This is uh, something, a container I drilled myself. Um, so this one, um, someone mentioned in Patreon about a mix of different Porcellionides prunosis, I believe. And this is, this is my party mix bin and it, I really like it. It's got Oreo crumbles, it's got the oranges, it's got the whiteouts, and it's got the powder blues. You can see lots of different ones in here. I'm actually going to feed these guys because they have such an incredible feeding response right out in the middle of you know everything they'll just they'll eat for us and I want to see it so we'll feed them a little bee pollen came from smug bug and uh, go with that so neon peach love that 503 Menagerie would like to see those and Wally's in the house I'm glad to see you here I, I want to say thank you to everyone and I'll probably say this again but I want to say thank you to all of those of you who sent your good vibes, sent your prayers, sent your condolences, anything, everything and anything that you did to help support me. I know last week I was having a hard time and I, I still am, but it's not as bad this week as it was then because right then the news was fresh and um, I really appreciate that. Um, hopefully, I don't know if I can talk about it exactly yet or not, we'll see, uh, but uh, I'm feeling supported by you. Thank you for those of you who messaged me on Patreon, who emailed me, who, whatever you did to contact me, uh, it really, really, I really appreciate it. And those of you who just mentioned something in the stream last week as well, uh, really helped. I felt uh, supported. I, I felt like people cared. People who, you know, have never seen me in real life cared, and that was, that was fantastic. It made a difference. So, Mia Kaliri just ordered my first isopods, hoping to get a, a lot of mix of Porcelio Scaber will be a pretty cleanup crew. Should be. They are so fun. I love the lottery mixes, like this party mix, you know, anything like that is fun. Critters and more, hello! So you've probably seen the email. Your snakes are on the way to you. We'll arrive tomorrow. Sean Meister, hello! Marie, hello! In Norway, excellent! So Tangerine was Punta Cana, that's what I was thinking, and that's, I think that's so cool. So, yeah, here's my party mix uh, of Porcellione des Prunosis. I love this one. They're so visible. That's part of the reason I like them so much. Emily, hello. Newt's Commander. Kurt Kitty. And Gretel, I am getting better. I am getting better. It's helping. And thank you, Wally. I appreciate that as well so yeah it's things like that kind of blindside you in life you know sometimes okay well i'm going to pull up the the patreon and we're going to do that and then we're going to start adding things to this enclosure this other one the, the microbarium Five hundred three Menagerie. Yours ignore the pollen, huh? Mine just scarf it. I don't know what the difference is. Whoa! I don't know if you can hear that. The snakes over there are mating up a storm, making a big noise in the leaf litter. But I don't know if you can hear that. Okay, so one of the ideas, or some of the ideas that people have put here in the chat, I'm gonna just get and give them a little more bee pollen because they're they're really going after. They must be pretty hungry. And a big part of the fun of watching isopods is 
marching them E, right? At least I think so. And Black Widow in my backyard, the Frank, ooh, wow. I have found many Black Widows in my backyard, but uh, yeah, it's not always, I mean, they're super cool spiders, but it can be a little unnerving, especially when you have little kids. When I, I you know, I would find them in my backyard when I had little kids. Now when my kids are old enough, it's not that big of a deal because they know to stay out of the way of a Black Widow. And Black Widows are really not that inclined to bite, but still, it can be kind of scary. So, Ashley N., did you know Oreo crumbles glow under a black light? I did not know that, and I'm curious now if whiteouts do. I think I think I see a video coming on. Um, I can credit you, Ashley, for giving me the idea and the knowledge that Oreo crumbles glowed under blacklight. Because I have two blacklight flashlights, and I've got lots of Oreo crumbles, and I've got lots of whiteouts, and I want to see what works. This is so cool. I wonder if the powder blues do, powder oranges. Pepe Rando, hello. Ozunaga, greetings from Indonesia. That's awesome. Therapod Hunter, hello. Mackenzie. Yeah, isn't this such a fun culture, Mackenzie? I, I just love them. Someday I want to do a, just a huge Porcelione de Sprinosis culture, like in a 20 gallon or something. Just have thousands and thousands of them. And Michael, yeah. Glad you caught the stream and the zebras are on the way. Let me know how it goes. So whiteout powders don't glow. Interesting. But the Oreo crumbles do. So cool. And Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, that's awesome. I helped get you into pea prunosis. That, that is very cool. That makes me happy. That makes me smile just to know that I helped uh, support or create enable your porcelianus prunosis uh, addiction, if you want to call it that. <laughs> that Maybe that's a bad word for it, but that's awesome. That makes me happy. And 503 Menagerie, if it were dark enough, I'd be doing the same thing. I'd be grabbing a blacklight right now. Seriously. I wonder if we could too. Redage white faces glow under a blacklight. That's so cool too. Orange cream did too? I guess that makes sense. Um... <laughs> They're upon the bend of cat biscuits you feed it also glows under black light. That's awesome. Yeah, they're so such a fun species this one. I'm wondering if it is the film, except the whiteouts don't do it. So there must be something in combination with the powdery film, the waxy coating that does it. But oh maybe not, because Ashley in saying the papaya, Kubaris marina does it. So, Alexander, I don't know if I say your name right, Alexander Grosse. Um, I'm new in the hobby from Germany. Excellent. Have some Porcelia Levis and some Muscus Acellus. Um, and I iced. Um, let's see. I would say some of the boldest isopods right here, you're looking at them. Porcelia Onides Prunosis are definitely among the boldest. Um, another one, Porcelia Ornatus Yellow Dot, super bold. Uh, Porcelia Levis Dairy Cow and Porcelia Levis Milkback, super bold. Zebras are pretty bold. Um, Porcelia Sibia, I've heard that too. I don't have that particular species, but I've heard that about them as well. So those are some species for you that should help out. And Gretel, your Hazai Ornatus and Acellus Mardi Gras just had babies in all three are new cultures. Your new isopods. You have excellent taste in isopods, seriously. Those are all some awesome isopods there. Um, do monkey have any special requirements? Well, Monkai can all, can dry out very fast, and being so small, and you have such a high you know a high mass to surface area ratio. If I'm saying that right, um, it's been a long day. I woke up at four o'clock in the morning to make sure all my boxes were done. So yeah, um, hopefully I said that right. But they do dry out quickly. Having them in an enclosure with a good uh, humidity gradient and moisture gradient in the substrate is about the only thing you need to really worry about in most cases. I mean, uh, lots of hiding places help too, but other than that, you're probably good. Oh, we got a super This is Morelia. Thank you for the Appreciate that. Mites in springtail cultures that really set back the springtail. Stop supplemental feeding. Anything else to do? Start over. Wait it out. 
You know, someone else was asking me about this problem too. Um, it is important to discover, <coughs> excuse me, whether or not um, this is whether or not this is an issue with predatory mites. If there are predatory mites in the enclosure that not not uh, parasitic mites, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about predatory mites that actually feed on the springtails. Or if these are grain mites that seem to be out-competing the springtails. That's the first thing to figure out. Um, I would say if you can determine that these are not grain mites, you know, they have the kind of the pointy face, the more oblong body, and they're fast moving, and they're predatory mites, they're eating the springtails, hunting them down, then there's not a lot you can do really except for sort of wait it out they, they tend, their population will tend to die back once they run out of springtails, and then you can restart. Um, and I've had that experience in the past. If they are grain mites, we need to figure out why they're going crazy. Uh, the stopping the supplemental feeding will help. Uh, make sure that they're not getting leaves that are too green. And um, by which I mean sometimes people will put leaves that are not quite decaying yet and put those in and that will really get the mites going um, and then probably you can do things to separate that culture um, if, if these are just springtail cultures if they're just springtail cultures um, here's another possibility okay and this is something that people have done in the past i haven't tried this particular trick but i learned it from a dart frogger somewhere i don't remember who uh, exactly but if you have dart frogs, and I don't remember Mr. and Mrs. Morelli, if you do, but if you do, you can actually set the culture open inside your dart frog enclosure. Let the dart frogs jump in. They will tend to eat the mites over time and leave some springtail eggs, and then you can take it out and restart. Um, I haven't tried that particular trick. If you do have dart frogs, it might be worth a shot. I hope that helps. And there's zero cool. And Emily, I'm super glad you're here. It's really fun to have just the community that we have here. It's, it's really awesome. And thank you, Frank to Tank. Julie Newcomb, we have a dairy cow colony. Thanks to you and your channel. Excellent. This is the kind of stuff that makes me smile. Everyone, thank you so much. Charcoal water and spring tells you got the reddish brown tiny, maybe slower moving mites. Okay, so possibly not the grain mites. Okay, well we need to figure out what is causing that. You might want to do a float treatment. Okay, this I've used this to get pests out of a few different kinds of cultures, and with springtails, fortunately, this works pretty well. Um, float treatment. You know how springtails are pretty hard to drown because they they float on the surface of the water they kind of don't get past the surface tension so you can you can drown your colony essentially you put enough water in it so you're just getting springtails in there and start a pristine culture with just springtails you skim off the top make sure your you know hands are clean and everything and just skim a bunch of springtails off the top of the water and put them into this new pristine culture it's better than trying to mess with the older culture that would be my advice to you if this is what's going on sounds like uh that may be your only option. And just make sure that when you do that, that the mites are not floating along because depending on the type of mites, you might get some floaters as well. Um, so you'll have to be really careful while you do that. And Julie, oh yeah, babies everywhere, I believe it. Um, Ozanaga dairy cows are a great starter for a newbie as long as you're prepared for uh, crazy reproduction. If you're okay with that, with maybe a bigger culture pretty soon and the fact that you're going to have to do something with all these babies, then sure, they're great for beginners. And Mr. and Mrs. Morelli, you're welcome. And if that floater system, you know, floater treatment that I mentioned, um, if that makes sense, great. If it doesn't make sense, then let me know. We can talk more about it. And Julie, that's awesome. You know, a lot of people say the Bob Ross of inverts or the Bob Ross of isopods, which I think is pretty cool because, you know, uh, Bob Ross is kind of a peaceful guy with some good vibes. I like that. So, I'm opening up Patreon here. 
we're going to get some suggestions and we're going to actually move away from this enclosure and start populating the other one. What do you think? You ready for that? I, I'm getting kind of my, my ASMR vibe off of these uh, isopods eating, but it's, uh, I could seriously watch these guys for hours. What do you think? So raw nature, all of the Porcellus cabrin mean are indeed Porcellus cabrin, not an identical species. Hmm, cool. Emily from Sweden, hello. You know, we need to get an isopod that looks like Bob Ross. That sounds pretty good to me. So let's see. So Ashley says some things we could put in the new enclosure is uh, zebras, clowns, jester if you have them, which I do, Punta Cana, magic potion, or simply what I call the circus mix. Zebras and clowns. I like that idea. It sounds really cool. Or big and small, like Porcelli Levis milk back in powder blue or orange. I also like that idea. Or black and white cruise uh, zebras and Oreo crumbles, if you have them, pandas. Cool. Actually, that's a, that's a super cool idea, too. And Ashley says she thinks about this a lot. I can, I can tell. you got some pretty aesthetically pleasing mixes going there. So Greta says, notice my springtails aren't nearly thriving as much in my drier cultures, Hazai and Ornatus. Are they not getting proper moisture requirements? How can I increase their numbers? First of all, let's figure out what kind of springtails you have. If you have Sinella curvaceta, they tend to do really well in the drier portions of the enclosures, as long as there's enough, you know, moisture and humidity. Wow, the snakes are going crazy over there. Um, if you have something like uh, Folsomia candida, they're going to do better in the moisture parts of the vivarium. So it could very well be, Greta, that that's what's going on. But let me know which species of uh, isopod, I mean, springtail you have in there. So Questifini. Questifini, I'm not sure how to say your name, but... Uh, well, welcome. Glad you're joining in. And Philoskia, or Philosia, different people say it different ways. Muscorum. I haven't actually ever kept that species. It's not on my permits, actually. The <laughs> happy little accidents mix. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Whatever we put in the, in the uh, microvarium is going to be the happy little accidents mix. Pepe Rando, you've got armadillo, armadillo officinalis with Dalmatian pattern that look like Shiro Utsuri. Yes, I would separate them, but not uh, just by themselves. I would separate them with a small group of others so that you have high incidence of genes, maybe three or four others, and see if you can get them, yeah, to reproduce. That would be so awesome. And Mac Nicholson, how often do armadillidae and vulgari reproduce? It depends, because different... Uh, Different localities, different morphs reproduce at different speeds. I've heard that the wild types generally reproduce only once a year, and they do produce big broods when they reproduce. The uh, captive types can do so more often, at least twice a year, but some will do more often than that. Some of them, like Orange Vigor, are really fast reproducers. And Oniscus ocellus to be active and visible all the time. In my experience, they're only moderately active and tend to hide a lot. But they will sit if they're, you know, in a calm, humid place, they'll sit there out in the open. Is that what you mean? Or are they running around? Because that's, that's kind of unusual. And Opaque Odyssey. Yeah, you were lucky with uh, your Armadillidium vulgari wild type. You already had a female that was holding uh, young, so excellent timing. You got monkey right away. Theropod Hunter Red Vulgari Colony sounds awesome. Is there isopods I should not put with tarantulas? Probably don't want to put... Depends on the tarantula and, and so on, but there's some species the, that may be protein hungry that might not want to put with them, like uh, maybe not Porcelio lavis or Porcelio ornatus, but of course some of those bigger ones could also be eaten by the, by the tarantulas too. Hmm. I think Porcelio scabers are going to be fine with a western hog nose, personally, as long as they have a good moisture gradient. Because um, something like a hognose snake is a little less vulnerable than some, you know, really soft-skinned species you might be dealing with. That would be my my take on it. And 503 menagerie, tell the species of springtail, can be tricky. A lot of them just say springtails. That is very true. Um, 
to tell the two that I mainly work with are the, uh, I work with the Fulsomia candida and the Sinella curvaceta. Sinella curvaceta are fast moving. They stay high off the ground. They're a little bit shorter bodied, slightly pink and fuzzy on the top. The Fulsomia candida are whiter in color, longer bodied and less likely to hop and they're slower moving. Hmm. And Dallin, we're getting there. Um, just send me like a screenshot of your weather for the next couple of weeks, so the next week or so, and we'll start to we can start opening that conversation and get that going. And Groovadelic, hello. The gecko, greetings. Um, so Gretel, if um, some websites will label their springtails as arid loving. Sinella curvaceta is the species that I like to go to for more, uh, you know, dryness tolerant springtails. They're still not tolerant of really, really dry conditions, but um, they are, uh, you know, more, more tolerant. When I noticed, for example, when I put them in with my pseudoscorpions, I was talking to uh, Kyle Candillion, the one I got the pseudoscorpions from, and I said, I've got Fulsomia candida springtails in there, and I don't see a lot of them, and, and so on, and they're not, and he said, well, you should put the Sinella curvaceta in because they'll spend a lot more time in the drier wood chips up in the top where the, the uh, pseudoscorpions are. Sure enough, I put some in and boom, that's what happened. They started going everywhere and uh, the pseudoscorpions really took off, started breeding more because they were getting more food. So they're always sitting on top of their hydration station, huh? Huh. How's the humidity in the enclosure? So, Johnsel, Mateo, have I ever kept armadillo, armadillo officinalis? I just got some. I don't know a whole lot about them. Sorry to hear about your dry, die-offs. I mean, you know, I know the basic care, but the basic care is similar for most isopods, so I'm not sure why they're dying off with bad molt. That's, that's not good. So, Julie Newcomb, so pink springtails at a local store. Can you talk about that? I kind of uh, don't use the common names a whole lot because I feel like they're really confusing because pink springtails can refer to a lot of different springtails. There's some that are really pink. There's the one I got. I know the Zinella curvaceta that's sometimes called pink springtails. It can be really confusing to be honest. So I think we need to get more into scientific names with springtails because tropical pink springtails, for example, are not truly tropical if you're talking about Zinella curvaceta because they live in... Uh, temperate areas too, so I think it's kind of an, an issue there. So Kevin, how long does it normally take rubber duckies to breed if you have the correct amount of adults and good male to female ratio in your starter culture? Uh, I think it depends on a lot of things. I mean, if everything's good and the, they're settled in, they're going to be breeding about every month, but sometimes it takes a couple of months for them to settle in. Mine took a while. Mine took almost a year, I think, before they settled down and bred, but I don't think that's always typical. And I had some adults, so I should have seen some earlier, but I didn't. So um, it really depends on whether or not they're ready in terms of the, the environment. They, there seems to be things in the environment. They need to be humid enough, for example, and then that'll help them. So Little Soft Gaming has the same issue with armadillos struggling to melt. Interesting. So at least it's, it's not an isolated issue. <coughs> <clears throat> so, excuse me. Emily, do you know where to get lichen? Well, you can go to craft stores and get lichen, but it's generally not lichen that uh, isopods will eat a lot. If you're just looking for it for a decorative thing for your isopods, you can put some of that in, like the reindeer moss style looking stuff. But uh, if you want something that will actually... Um, sorry, the airplane's coming through. I don't know if you can hear me. But... Mostly, lichen is going to have to be collected if you want it to be something that the isopods are going to eat. Just off of the tree bark. Yeah, Pepe Rendo, that's true. Armadillo, armadillo aficionados can live to be nine, is what I've heard. So they're really long, uh, long-lived isopods. Probably the longest living terrestrial we know of. 
So Frank to tank an orange vigor individual looks pink. That's awesome. You could do some fun stuff with that. So Mac Nicholson, you found a fourth species in Michigan that looks similar to Florida Fast. That's interesting because I don't think Florida Fast gets that far up, but you got something going on. Well, Quirt, Kurt123, you're welcome. Glad that uh, the videos have helped. Do I have a humidity recommendation for Armadillian vulgari? I keep a gradient going in my tank. I keep it between 60 and 80. I think you're fine with that. Um, recommend that, that range. As long as you have a gradient and you have, you know, decent ventilation, they should be fine. So pseudoscorpions are, are not much like whip scorpions. I mean, they are, they are arachnids, but uh, they're basically like little chubby pear-shaped scorpions with no tails. That's basically what you get. Um, sorry, I'm just turning off the uh, turning off my phone. It's making noises. I want to start putting some isopods in, folks. What do you think? Let's get this container. This is the microvarium enclosure. Microvarium.com. Martin was kind enough to send me. I wanted to put. First of all, one of my very favorite species of Armadillidium is Armadillidium gestroy. And I have two cultures of these, of these. Love this species. That one's going in for sure. Okay, there's our first inhabitant. All right, I wanted to, to do that. So, let's see. Hmm. So it sounds like, Alexander, you're doing the right thing. How long have you had them? And Newt Scamander, that's a good call because they do look rather similar to Philoskia muscorum, and mus those are fairly fast isopods too. Dom's Dragons? Well, thank you. Isopods are pretty amazing, aren't they? I'm glad I helped bring that to your attention. That's pretty cool. Chubby scorpions with no tail. That's basically what they look like. Oh, we got a super chat from Tarantula Collective. Um, just dropping in to show some love and send some support. Well, thank you, Richard. Always appreciate it. Do they live next to an airport or are they having an air show next door? <laughs> I actually live close to an air base, an air force base. It's called the Hill Air Force Base, and it's probably 10, 15 minutes drive from my house, and so they, they do their flights very frequently, and got the the fighter jets going over so they are um, they're always going by <laughs> so thanks again Richard I really appreciate it okay three weeks um, Alexander as long as you're not getting die-offs I'd say it's not necessarily a bad sign Something interesting about pseudoscorpions is they have venom in their pinchers, but they can't hurt humans as far as I know. Yeah, they cannot hurt humans, and some of them do have their venom glands in their pedipalps and can deliver the venom that way, which is really fascinating. And that is so cool, Julie, to know that Richard's the one who sent you my way. Love that. This is my next pick. It's like the Porcelio version of Armadillidium gestroy. One of the Porcelio versions of Armadillidium gestroy. It is Porcelio ornatus nord, or north. Love these. This is a young one, hopefully. I, I think I put a male gestroy in there, and this is a young one, and these uh, Porcelio ornatus don't tend to breed until they get a little bigger, so I'm hoping that one hasn't made it. If it's a female, I didn't really check, so we'll see. Okay, well, Alexander, sounds like you're, you're good to go. And Therapod Hunter, if you've been seeing an influx of dragonflies in my area, even if you don't live near a water source, something that could be happening is uh, 
when ant colonies are releasing their alates, their queen and, uh, you know, the reproductive young males and females, that could uh, account for it because they, they tend to um, kind of swarm. I'm going to put a milk back in there. The milk back's too fast to really get it on camera. But, yeah, one thing that uh, somebody pointed out to me is that, uh, I think it was Scott from Finger Lake Feeders, is that Porcelli Ornatus Nord gets bigger than all the other Porcelli Ornatus. So I'm, I'm wondering if it'll get large in here because of less uh, competition with others. Um, so there we go. We got a milk back in there and it's a male. And it is. This is a small setup. So I'm not going to put a ton in here because uh, it would be easily overcrowded. That is very true. I got limits to what I can do with an enclosure this size, but I think we'll, we'll come up with something fun. Okay, so we just put, we got three isopods in there right now. I really wanted to put one of my favorite species in here. I'm going to do that right now while you look on and guess what it is. And... Ah, Matthew, your, your third isopod species, your zebras, arrived today. That's awesome. I'm going to put, coincidentally enough, a small zebra in here because I think if I, I put one in that's small enough, it probably won't breed. I mean, no guarantees. Zebras are pretty prolific breeders, but I'm going to put a baby zebra in there. Oh, it dropped. Didn't really get a great look at that, did you? Sorry, but maybe it'll be running around. Kurt, Kurt123 has a question of cuttlefish bone here, and I was wondering which area to put it in the enclosure, on the dry side or the middle? I'd put it on the dry side. Probably wouldn't do a whole lot of damage to put it in the middle, but there is a kind of uh, bacterium that can be harmful, kind of a pink bacterium. They'll grow on certain wet surfaces, things like shrimp skins and whatnot, and it could grow possibly on the cuttle bone if it's too wet. So maybe keeping it on the dry side would be better. That's, uh, th those are my two cents right there on that. Okay, I'm bringing over some more isopods to put in here. I'm gonna also pull up uh, Patreon. Um, Ashley N has a question about ABG mix. Um, when and how to use it? Is it all created equal? Well, basically ABG mix is a lovely thing that was developed, it stands for Atlanta Botanical Gardens Mix, and it was created there by, uh, well, with the purpose of it, I don't remember who created it, but the purpose of it was to provide a substrate for growing certain plants that was very, very porous, both to liquid and to air exchange, so that roots of things like um, epiphytic plants like bromeliads of various kinds and orchids and things like that could have a nice substrate that stayed moist, retained moisture, but allowed air to travel through it very uh, easily as well. So it didn't get, you know, when it's very wet, it didn't get anoxic, basically, you know, rot. And, and so they developed it with things like the uh, tree fern fibers and uh, sphagnum moss and orchid bark and things like that that tended to create a mix like that. Bits of charcoal, things like that in it. And that seems to uh, seems to have worked for them. And it's not created equal, but it, that's basically when the use, that's the use case for it. When you want a substrate that uh, both air and water will travel through, it works great. Oh, there's a tiny little springtail running around on me too. It's a very dark spring tail. I wonder if it was just eating something. This is Armadillidium nasatum whiteout, a very small one. Hopefully small enough so it's not going to be breeding. I wanted to put it in here um, as well because I love nasatum. And uh, just having a pure white eye spot in here would be some good variety. So that's what I was thinking. Uh, so a great use for uh, ABG mix is in any, uh, like a dart frog style enclosure. Very humid, low ventilation and uh, tends to work great for that kind of situation. Is it all created equal? Well, the true Atlanta 
botanical gardens recipe if you're following it I and mean, it's going to be the same but there are different versions of it there are versions that are tweaked a little bit to handle different levels of humidity like uh, New England herpeticulture produces a similar to ABG mix that uh, is better for lower humidity environments but it's similar in other ways things like that so there are different versions out there and ABG is sort of an umbrella term now but it actually descends from that original use so I hope that helps Critters and More says Porcelio Scaberlato mix gets my vote, but Punta Cana would be cool as well. Where Por Porcelio Scaberlato mix is fun, and so is Punta Cana, um, both of which I love. And in honor of what you say, and also because I wanted to do it anyway, Brayden, I'm going to put a Porcelio Scaber lava in here because that's my favorite morph of Porcelio Scaber, and I've got lots of baby ones. And this is funny, a lot of the babies that I've seen are coming out with their, their orange on the front and dark on the back. I don't know if you'll be able to see this little guy, but mostly dark on the back and orange in the front. I think that one is small enough not to be big enough to breed, but we'll see um, how that goes. So there's my lava that I put in there. And Ashley Ann was suggesting a Nizatum candy mix. I totally want to do one of those. I, I really do. They're like a, a gem mix from Armadillidium vulgari, but it's Armadillidium nasatum. And I now have three types of Armadillidium nasatum. I have pearl, I have whiteout, and those look kind of similar. And then I have the peaches, and well, some wild types show up in my uh, whiteout culture because it's not fully isolated yet, mostly. And then I really want to um, get some oranges, not just peaches, but oranges, which are so cool. And desert clown beetle larvae look a lot different than mealworms. Clognog, I guess it depends on what you mean by a lot different. They're, they're very similar in, in just cursory looks. So you can find uh, characteristics that look different. For example, well, to look at the blue death finning beetle larva, the, the terminal segment on their body is not pointed. It's like a half moon shape, and it's hairy. And that helps you recognize those, for example. So you have to look at the individual species and see how it goes. So, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, you like the idea? Yeah, I think this is a lot of fun. Um, it just, uh, I've been wanting to do it for quite a while, actually, and so this is a perfect opportunity with this enclosure because I'm not trying to breed anything in there, and so I think it's going to be a different, a different dynamic entirely than if I were mixing species, populations of species, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to pull a small clue guy from my garter snake enclosure over here. There's hundreds of them in there. And I'm going to pull a small one out and put it in here. I think this is in honor partly of uh, Ashley's idea of the circus mix, which actually sounds really cool. And partly because I just wanted to do that. Uh, fun species. All right. A question from Ashley again. What is more harmful to keep ice pods too wet or too dry? Does this depend on the species? To some extent, it does dis depend on the species. But I would say that in general, you'll kill isopods more quickly by keeping them too dry. Um, they can die in minutes sometimes if it's too dry or, or hours. And too wet is usually a matter of days or weeks or even months. So I would say probably more harmful to go too, um, too dry. It's, it's going to be a faster death. I, I think Warren McMonagall mentions that in his book too. So Ashley had a question about green powdery mold on magnolia leaves in the bottom of cork bark. Is there a way to prevent this? Will this type of mold hurt isopods? It seems like most of the types of mold in that show up in enclosures, uh, you have to watch out for a couple of things. There's so many different types of mold that keeping up with them all is actually really tricky. So to be honest, I'm not sure about this green powdery mold, exactly what the nature of it or whatever it is. Um, some slime molds look kind of like that, and those aren't true, true molds, but it may or may not be a slime mold, maybe something else. Um, generally, I have seen powdery molds like that, and I don't think they're necessarily as bad as some of the ones that uh, are the long filamentous molds, because those tend to catch isopods and get them stuck. Um, so that's, that's kind of a problem. But, yeah, I'm not sure about this particular one or what this particular type that you have, whether or not it's harmful to isopods. 
I would say it's just the general stuff that you, I'm sure you're already doing, like, uh, you know, springtails, ventilation, not feeding right on the substrate, that kind of thing. I'm sure you're already doing that, so that's not going to be much help if I say that. But it might help someone else who's a beginner. And I wish I could help you more with that one, Ashley. That's a tricky one. So, another question from Mackenzie. Porcelio Unides Prunos is also my vote for inhabitants. You could selectively breed away your crimples for reduced or enhanced spotting, vibrancy, or maybe even consistent patterns. So this is an interesting idea. I know that Smugbug has talked about selecting for um, high contrast with, with hers, and I want to do that with mine too. They're just a little bit hard to select because they're so fast and they're running around all the time. But I, I think I want to do something like that. I think that would be fun. And I've heard rumors of other morphs going on. There's a morph in the Philippines of uh, Porcelione des Prunosis. I think they call it Red Koi. It looks pretty fantastic. It's a little bit like orange cream, but with fewer spots. And uh, it's more red. I wish I could get some of those. So catching up with the chat now here, if, if I can. Blue Death Fanning Beetle breeding going. Um, it's been successful. I've produced some adults, but... I have kind of had it on hold with, as I've been raising the snakes, but actually the last of the baby snakes went to their new homes today. So I may, if I can rearrange the room properly, I may be able to make it work so that I could, uh, I could do something with that and, and get the beetles breeding again. The other day I was going through their enclosure, found a huge larva and took it out, but I didn't have anything set up for it. I mean, I put it in a little bin and everything, but I didn't have any place warm enough. I put it in a warm place, but I didn't have an incubator. And unfortunately it died, so I think it was just about at the point of pupating when I found it, and I didn't get it into a warm place fast enough, which is sad. So it, it passed away. But I am so excited that the Blue Death Fading Beetle breeding is a thing. It's working. That is so exciting. And Willie is back. Excellent. So, yeah, Alexander, the Oniscus Ocellus is not all that common in the uh, hobby, but Mardi Gras, we have orange maple, we have the wild types. I'm trying to remember what else we have. I know Finger Lake Feeders is working with some interesting stuff. Um... Kevin, I know that if you keep, well, keeping the scarlets and the bumblebees together, I did it for a few years, and it ended up, at first the scarlets had the upper hand, and then as things progressed, the uh, others got the upper hand, and now um, I only have bumblebees left. That is it. So, just a word to the wise. I'm looking over here at different ideas of what I should put in there, um, into this little microvarium. If you have some suggestions for species, let me know. I'm going to pull one out right now, though. And this will be maybe the only species I'll add for today. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm thinking about it. Try to do a small one. It's got to be a small one. It's not a small one. It's not going to work, I think, with this species. Got one. Got one. I hope this works. This is a Silisticus convexus Ukraine pied. Some interesting colors in it. And they are such fast little creatures. And I think if I let more than one in there, you know, if, if I didn't if I put some reproductive ones in there, I'd have a problem. I would they'd probably overrun the whole thing. So that's what I'm gonna put in there. For that one. And looking at the chat, trying to catch up. And yes, you should keep springtails with your isopods. Speaking of springtails, hmm. Well, actually, speaking of Aniscus ocellus, I was thinking about putting a BC maple in here. I think that'd be kind of fun. And I don't have an Armadillidium vulgari in here yet. So, any recommendations on those? Um, which morph I should put in? I can, I can really only do one. 
But I want to put, I'm just going to put a maple aniscus ocellus in here because I really like the look of them. And I think it, they'd probably do well in here. So if I can, they're fast when they're upset. This is a little baby one. There's a little maple. Aniscus ocellus. There it goes. Let's see what it does if it's just going to sit there. Hmm. So there's some orange, Ashley. I think I put, at the beginning, I put a, an orange lavis in there, and now we've got an orange oniscus ocellus. So just kind of looking at the other cultures here, seeing what I got. Some of these cultures that I haven't even talked about yet, I would like to put some in, but I'm not sure. I want to let the cultures mature a little bit more before I do that. I think. But I, I do need to put uh, an Armadillidium vulgare in here. And I need to put a Porcellionides prunosis. Uh, let's see. Have you ever used egg carton underneath substrate kill cast? Huh. I've heard of it doing it. I've never really done that myself. Interesting idea. Um, blue lizard jelly. You think you get another garter litter this year? Um, here, I'm going to put one more isopod in, and we'll come look at my garters in, for a minute. We'll talk about them. I'm going to put an Oreo crumbles in. Cause that's probably my favorite morph. Just a little baby one. If I can find a really tiny, really really tiny one, that's what I need. Has to be very very small so that it doesn't breed in here. Um, oh, those are too big. Hold on. Oh, that one's probably small enough. Let's see what I can do here. There it is. This is a tiny little Oreo crumbles going in. Okay, perfect. I think it worked out. I'm tempted to put a rubber ducky. I am. I'm tempted to put a rubber ducky in there, but I don't know if I will do that or not. Let's see, we have Justin, my clowns behave very weird and out of only cultures are the least prolific. Interesting. I, I think I've discovered that uh, I think I've discovered that my clowns do so much better in my garter enclosure than they do in a bin. They do fine in a bin. I mean, they breed and everything, but they're just really thriving really really thriving in uh, the garter snake enclosure it's kind of fun okay I'm looking for a small T plus albino isopod there's one that's probably small enough I don't know looking for a really small this one's small enough for sure okay here's a T plus albino armadillidium vulgari very very tiny that should be small enough so I don't have to worry about breeding um, and I just was thinking, what do you think about a Flava Marginatus in there? I think it'll be, there'll be enough ventilation. I love Flava Marginatus, they're so active. And, uh, I'm sorry, that's not going to work. I'm going to have to set this down for the moment. Um, yay or nay on the Flava Marginatus, what do you think? Okay, let me see. Catching up on the chat. Trying to anyway, probably not going to make it done. Oh, those spiny isopods are something, aren't they? Okay, I'm going to put a little, a really small Flava Marginatus in here because I love them. They're so active. I think that would work well. Probably see a lot of it. I'm hoping I would. There's a small one. They're always breeding, and never not breeding. I just have to actually get one. They're harder to get than they sound. This is a tiny little Flavo Marginatus right there. Tiny one. Let's do it. 
And then rubber ducky, I think I think people are saying the rubber ducky. I have to do the rubber ducky. Right? Oh, we got a donation from Quest Infini. I found two completely black armadillidium vulgari in my culture. Is there a name for that morph? How soon should I start separating them? That is super cool. How many do you have in your culture? Because that is something you should definitely be pursuing for sure. Um, breeding them if they are like pure black. I don't know if there's a name for the morph. I haven't actually seen any. I've heard rumors of them, but haven't seen them. So I'm really curious about it. And would love to see those more in the hobby. So, yep. And Zeno, welcome to the live stream. Glad to see you here. So, I'm not going to get all the chat. Um, but, Alexander, I am so glad I was part of the reason you got into isopods, too. Okay. A rubber ducky's hard to breed. Can be a little tricky to get them to a position where they start breeding. Once you get them there, though, they're pretty easy. And they'll produce babies quite frequently. I have... My colony took a while to get going, so I wasn't really dialed in their husbandry, but now I am, and there's always babies in here. Last time I looked, there were probably between 50 and 70. That's my estimate of how many I had, and it's been a while since I last checked numbers. I'm going to see if I can find a wee one to put in here. Um, that one's huge, that one's really tiny. I'm just looking around. Sorry, I have to pick up limestone and stuff. And oh, there are loads in here. Holy cow. There are more in here than there were the last time I checked, for sure. I would hold this over the... Hmm, sorry, I'm... It's, it's kind of rude of me to do it this way, huh? I don't really mean to. I'm just kind of making it up as I go. There's my little... Oh, did you see my little ducky I put in there? Hopefully it's not too big. One problem is... Once you lift up the piece of limestone, then you got loads of them under there. You don't want to set it down on them and crush them. So I'm scooting duckies out of the way right now. Hopefully, they'll be out of the way. Whoa! Don't want to drop any duckies either. Okay. Mm. Whoa. We okay? We okay, folks? Okay. This is what I just did. Just going to show you here. This is my, my ducky enclosure. Um, let's pick up, I don't know how many are going to be under there. There's lots of them hiding in the, in the holes in this piece of limestone. And I'm just trying to really carefully set them back down and not crush them. It is challenging to do so without hurting them. Hopefully that was good. I'm going to pick up this bit. Oh, that was, see what we got under here. It's a much smaller piece of limestone. So there's only a couple there, but they're doing pretty well. The colony is is breeding. You can see there's a small piece of limestone, tons of springtails in there. They're doing their thing. Um, I think I'm actually going to take a little bit more of this uh, moss from here because that's how I seeded it before. Just toss that in and make sure the other bin gets plenty of springtails. And now I'll put the lid back on. Why not? Okay, so, coming back to the chat. And I'm probably going to miss some of it, sorry. But, this is tricky. Trying to do all this with just my two hands. I am envious of people who have other people to help them with their live streams, because I generally do not. But, um, well, I have you to help me, but I mean people on hand here in, uh, you know, in the same space I'm in. So, now I remember I said I was going to look at the snakes for a minute, so let's do that if everybody's good with it. I'm going to look at the ceiling for a minute. Sorry. And here we go. Let's look at the snakes. 
They're, they're going crazy in here. Just mating up a storm, like I said. Maybe we'll uh, see if they want to come say hi. They usually do. They usually do. Even if they don't want to eat, they're often pretty excited about coming to say hi. Here's Ruby. She's wondering what's going on. Um, Yep, you want to come say hi, Ruby? Let's do it. Let's come say hi. Oh, I got two snakes come to say hi. Or is he just following his girlfriend? How long does it take for the springtail population to get dense? That dense? It can be pretty fast. It can be as little as you know, a month or six weeks. Ah, and thank you, Frank, for letting me know. I... Need to watch the time. Now I got snakes all over me. Here I go. I'm gonna pick them up and move them over. And then we got a third snake in there in the back. He's a little bit wondering what's going on, maybe. But here's here are these beauties here. I like that they're so friendly. It's one of my favorite things about them. Ooh, knocked over that. See this. Even when they're not hungry, like I was saying, it's funny that they just want to come out. Um, so blue li lizard yellow, I have both uh, clay and uh, charcoal going too. Yep. And Pepe Rondo, you can totally recommend isopod stores. There are a lot of species I don't sell. So there are three in here. There's one female and two males. Um, Clog, now you got ball pythons, awesome. That's something I've been thinking about getting into. Yeah, these, these guys are really social snakes. That's part of the reason I wanted to get into garters, because they're not only communal, they're social, with humans. They, they kind of like to hang out with humans. They're sort of the snake equivalent of the uh, emerald tree skinks, in that they they generally, even when they're totally not hungry, won't want food, they will refuse food and they'll still come and want to climb on me. So it's fun. Yeah, she, she's pretty big. She really is. She's, and she's bigger, I think, than she looks on, on camera here. She's, she's a big girl. Oh, where are you going, Rufus? He's trying to go play in the fish tank. I'm not going to allow that. He'd be snapping up blue star endlers like, no tomorrow. And I love how corn snakes will do that too, like Ashley was saying. Um, critters and more, I actually think that handling the garters from a young age is really good. Like, when you get yours, start handling them you know, I've tried to handle them, and so they're not completely uh, unaccustomed to handling. Usually, they freak out when you're taking them out because they hate something coming from above. But once they're in your hand, they calm down pretty fast. And just get them used to that, and then get them into a front open enclosure as soon as they're 12 inches long or longer. And they will, uh, they'll like that a lot better. They, they tend to be a lot less spooked by that. So... I actually need to measure this girl. It's been a while since I measured her, and I, you know, took I take measurements periodically, and write them down and whatnot. I use the um, SERP widgets app to measure them because it's a lot easier than any of the other methods that I found. She's pretty big. She's over three feet long, but I don't remember how long. And Dagobah Dave. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. I'm glad that you had a good experience getting isopods from me. Yeah, I would say, um, Braden, try to handle them several times a week, if not every day, except on the, you know, feeding, after feeding, you know, give them their 24 hours. Garter snakes don't really need 48. Some snakes, you know, it's better if you give them 48 hours. Garter snakes don't, because they digest so fast. 
Mm. Actually, I love the name Lego for a for a hognose snake. That's kind of cool. I don't know why, but I love it. Mm. They're really going nuts now. I'm going to see if I can juggle three at a time. It's kind of hard to do. I do take them out and do that once in a while. So, Supreme Gecko. Um, most of the multis are doing great. I've got a lot of fry in there. That's what I always say, but it's always true. Um, fry in varying ages, including some very tiny ones. Um, and I do have one multi that looks like it's going to have bloat, and I'm probably going to have to take it out and euthanize it, which is awful, but it looks like what's going on. But all the others are doing fine. Oh, like try to slip between the gap. Yes, they do that. Totally do that, and it's annoying because I'm afraid they're going to get hurt. So, Mackenzie, I'm going to answer this question, and then I should probably wrap up. Um, their preferred food is large pinkies. That's what they get, often dusted with calcium and vitamin supplements and even pigmentation supplements sometimes. I'm starting to work that in a little bit, help show off the reds a little bit more. Um, generally, Rapashi. Rapashi Calcium Plus, Rapashi Super Pig. I've started to use that a little bit. Um, so, yeah, that's, I do give them earthworms, and they've had tilapia, they've had reptilinks, things like that. But large pinkies is what they're mostly on. And, all right, very cool. So, I'm going to pick up this little guy. And going to bid you all a good night. Um, hope you all stay healthy and safe. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the participation, all the super chats. And uh, catch you next time.